As we think about God's role for the, the men, we look at Genesis 2. Go to Genesis 2, please. I've always thought this interesting. Genesis 2, verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. He no sooner than creates man than he gives him a job. Think about that. That's, you know, man needs to work. You know, other passages say man doesn't work, shouldn't he? Men need to work. They just need to work. Okay? So he gave him a job right off the bat. And the Lord God commanded the man. You ever realize look at that? The head of man commands the man. I had somebody ask me uh, if they could come to the woman And that would be kind of funny, so I said, well, I said, you know, for instance, when I'm dealing with my son at his age, and I don't want any, how can I say this nicely, emotional exchange in the situation, I'll take him outside and deal with it, okay? You know what I'm saying? Grown men need to talk to grown men sometimes without having the other help there, okay? Sometimes that's a good way to do it, okay? Those of you that are fathers that have been fathers for a while will concur. Sometimes you deal with your son. You can deal with him directly. And uh, now, ideally, and I found this to be true in the long run, but ideally, the woman, the mother, is no pushover either. Okay? I come home, I'm, I'm, I'm back. Sorry, Daniel, you're a PK. He was pretty young, but a lot smaller too, but. Uh, I don't remember what the situation was. If I call home at lunch hour and my mom's like, I'm having trouble with Daniel, isn't that the other room? I drove all the way home, which isn't too far from me, and I dealt with him on my lunch hour. Okay? Since then, I've learned that my wife and his personality sometimes, okay, they're both, they're both very mild mannered, very calm on the outside, but sometimes they have temper flares, and if they're both doing that at the same time, it's very counterproductive. So to make a long story short, uh, there's been times I've also come home, and uh, my wife was tempered up, and I've had to take her in the other room, away from him, and say, look, you know, look at the big picture here. So you're upset right now. You need to think about what is going on in order to be able to make a good decision about it. Yeah. You guys need to be able to do that in your life. You guys need to be able to look at and analyze a situation. By the way, that's why we're left brain. That's why God designed us to fix it. Okay? Be able to look past the emotions. Now, having said that, th there is a significant amount of us left brain men, I guess, that have a tendency to look too far past the emotions. Mm -hmm. And maybe some of the men here can understand that. I I'm in there. And, and not have as much compassion on the situation if it is warranted. Not consider the other person's feeling at all. We don't want to do that either. Okay? You can go too far the other, the other extreme either. But a child, a man, a young boy does not grow up to be a man holding on to mama's apron strings. Does it? If the mother, the wife, is making excuses for the boy. The father needs to deal with it. On both sides, right? Mm -hmm. Deal with the boy, no more excuses, and deal with the mom. Okay? Very, very, I should say common sense things, <clears throat> but things that are helpful as we look to that. <clears throat> I personally think every young man needs to sweat, work hard, Work out in the cold. Toil in the sun until he develops his work ethic. Okay? What I mean by that is when you do something physically that is hard, difficult to do, it does something for you inside. You're denying your flesh the comforts of home. Get off the couch! Shut the game or the TV or whatever it is off to get in your way of reality. 
No, I'm split some wood for the house. I don't know. I, we're in, we live in a culture today of lazy men. Can I say that? We live in a culture of lazy men. You say it louder. <laughs> I hear you get loud enough before it's all over. Right? But yeah, we do. You know, and I don't know. I work with four or five guys and in a shop. Somebody else was talking about, uh, Scott was talking about, working in a shop environment is abrasive at times. Oh, yeah. And uh, so, you know, you have to, to look at them. And the only way to deal with them sometimes is head on. They work with their hands. I told somebody a while back, there's a difference in a man that works with his hands that is a very physical person. And how you deal with them, how you cope with them is different than a man who, by nature, just doesn't have to work with his hands. There's, there's varying degrees of men and different cut types, okay? But I believe that when you learn to sweat, you learn to work hard. You know, one of the, this may sound tacky, but one of the reasons why I did 50 push-ups the day I turned 50 was to show my son that his dad is not afraid to do the hard things in life. Okay? It wasn't for the people that showed up. It was for my son. Because he needs an example of physicalness. Now, I don't feel, I haven't done them since then, by the way. <laughs> but the point is, but, but he knows that. He knows that if dad isn't doing it now, it's because dad's back in the cloud or dad's hip hurts or whatever it is, okay? And uh, I saw a picture the other day of uh, a brother Art out in the uh, concrete. He was full of concrete. He had concrete all over, okay? He wasn't letting his sons do, he was in the middle of the work. And there's something to be said for that. Don't shirk your responsibilities in life because you will be teaching your sons to shirk their responsibilities in life. Okay? Every young man should work. Hard work and toils of life help a man find out his physical abilities and develop his competence as a man. I made sure my son knew how to split wood before the 16. Anybody can drive a car, by the way. It's pretty easy nowadays. I mean, it's not like the old, you know, days you have column shifts or whatever, you know, it's a little more mechanical to do those things. But to split wood with a nine pound split off my grandpa, who's 83 years of age, 84, he doesn't need to split his own wood, okay? So, I used to go do it some myself, but, you know, I guess somebody else that needs to do it, right? So, you know, those are the things that... The level of expectation that you want out of your kids starts with the head of the home. In that sense, the buck stops here, right? But that position was given to you by your head. So, we exemplify that in our life pattern by learning to be humble to our head as well. And uh, honestly, what that looks like gets fun sometimes to me because there is uh, a tendency to uh, glory in the manliness of men. Okay? There's a tendency to think of how much I can let and what I can do. Okay? And I'll be the first to admit I have that tendency in me as well. You don't want to develop pride in your sons to the point where they don't think they have to listen. Okay? Everybody has a head. And when you personally, as the father and the husband, acknowledge your head in humility, it gives them a chance to look past you because you're pointing at your head, who is Christ. 1 Corinthians 7, Ephesians 5, you should know the passages. They need to learn how to swing an axe, yes. But look at David. David was young, slight of build apparently. And he knew what he could do. You know, read that story. Because he had already proved it to himself with the job he had. 
And if it were, he was tending sheep. He was tending sheep out in the hills where there was wolves, bears, lions. I find tigers and bears and lions. Okay? I don't think when Jesse told David to go tend the sheep out there in the hills that Jesse's wife said, but he's so young. He's smaller than all his brothers. No boy ever grew up to be a man holding on to mama's apron strings. A godly woman would try to protect, won't try to protect her boy from the hard things in life. She will teach them, go get a tiger. That's what my wife says. <laughs> one of her little phrases. She'll be like Samuel's mom who would give up her young man, I'm not sure what age, and send him to heal. But you know, there is another side to the coin again. You don't want a son full of pride and arrogance. You really don't. Somebody so full of himself that he flaunts his stature, parades like a rooster, and shows off his muscles every chance he gets. An egotistical male isn't going to love unselfish. Pride gets in the way. It just does. He's going to be more like Samson. Goes over to foreign lands and comes back and he sees the harlot standing on the corner good looking thing and he goes back home and he says there's a woman over there get her for me read that you talk about mass that but was Samson a manly man yeah but did Samson have a huge issue yeah just about got him killed didn't it well it did eventually read the stories <laughs> in the Bible the old testament stories yes and read about the men. Read about David's fall. What happened to him? Because he didn't flee youthful lust. Okay? Find out what happened to his son. He hanging around in a tree somewhere. Long haired guy getting stuck in a tree. There are different kinds of handcuffs, I guess. Many a father was proud of his manly son. But God's word also says, exhort young men to be sober-minded. Can I tell you that's not easy? That's not easy for me. I get goofy, stupid, crazy sometimes. Exhort them to be sober-minded, says it. There's a reason insurance companies charge more for young men. Think about that. As you mature in your growth, your focus isn't necessarily on pushing the long skinny pedal on the right elbow of arm. I love doing that. I'll be the first to admit it when I was younger too. But at some point you go out of stuff like that. One night I was coming home from work and I was moving pretty fast on my way home. And it dawned on me. I looked down and it dawned on me. My impatience, my aggressiveness could get me killed on the way home under the wrong set of circumstances. I got a wife and kids at home that need me to be I got a wife and kids that need me in, in a whole body to be there. For them, to help them, to lead them, to protect them. I can't do that. If my ego's a flare and I'm doing something stupid, my back goes out and I'm no good for a weekend. My wife has to support me because I can't stand up. Been there a couple times, by the way. Talk about a little humbling experience. Pretty good for you sometimes. 
The hardest thing strong males will ever have to do is tell yourself no. It's easy to tell other people no. If you're strong-minded, you got whatever going on in the back of your head, your heart, you got a lot of drive and intestinal fortitude or whatever. You know, it's easy to tell people no. What's hard is telling yourself no. That's the hardest thing that you will ever do is to abstain from what you want to do for the good of not only your personal spiritual growth, but for the growth of others around you. Can I tell you, at the time in your life when you want to do what you want to do because you want to do it, you may be damaging other people around you that care about you. Maybe you're young. Maybe you don't have kids. Maybe that's not your area in life right now. But there's always people who look at you, who watch you, who respect you, or maybe they just like you because you're likable. And they'll see that. And they ask me. Some people come to me and ask me questions. Hey, where's so-and-so? You know? Everybody affects other people around them. I told you, you know, in my house, when, when I'm hard to deal with, when I'm in the flesh, when I'm not doing so well spiritually, the dog leaves the room just like that because she's sensitive to the master of the house or whatever, okay? But that reminds me that uh, I must be raising my voice. I must be you know, getting a little strong about something, okay? And like someone else said here, there are times when you do get strong about things, right? There are times that you say, hey, stop, okay? That's, that's enough. If you have young kids, there's a lot of that time, okay? In that process where they're growing and learning and making decisions and growing up. There's a lot of no's in life. They're just dark. In fact, there's more no's than there are yeses in life, okay? 1 Corinthians 1 teaches about that. In Christ, it's yay. Talk about proper positive thinking. That's what that, 1 Corinthians 1. In Christ, it's yay. So I can't help it if you're trying to live in your flesh and I have to stop you all the time. You know, you got young kids, that's what it's about. And you need to be strong-minded enough and know the truth of God's word enough to stop those young kids from doing what they want to do. As a father figure, the most important thing that you will do is affect the lives of young people and shape their character at a young age. The most powerful thing they can learn between two and whatever, yeah, I said two, maybe even a little bit younger than that, depending on the situation, is it's not their turn to do whatever they want to do right now. I've watched that. In our well, long before our assembly was established, I watched Art and them grow up, and with all them kids, and, and them kids at a young age learned to sit still. Did they get anything out of it? I, I want to learn by watching too. I don't always do that, but I learn by watching. And I'm like, wow! I got to teach my kids this. And I watched, and I and I tried to. And you know what they learned? It's not all about me. Brother Luke's song. It's not all about me. It's all about Christ. What a principle to give to kids. It's not all about them. That they can grow up to be a man before they're strutting their stuff and thinking they are a man. Is it any, It's okay, by the way, to grow up early. Can I say that? It's okay to grow up early. Nobody said you're an adult when you turn 18. Well, the world does. Can I tell you it's okay to grow up before you're 18? It's okay to grow up before you're 35, too, okay, whatever. There's a lot of things out there that will stunt your growth if you take them in. When you get curious, read Proverbs, first seven chapters. Read about the young man who's out there running around the middle of the night. That's why I wrote that song, God's Ways Better, by the way. Been there, okay? Run around the middle of the night, having what he calls fun. And that strange woman, that whore, runs over and grabs him. You gotta know what to do when that situation comes up. Which ah, I never happened to me. Well, it wasn't it wasn't a harlot, but I had that happen to me a couple times. 
some of it in gullibility. Might, some people would call it naivety. Not knowing something that can cause you to make a life-changing situation is no excuse for being there when you know the being there part was wrong to begin with, right? Can't make excuses for that. The situation is under your control because if you don't need to be there, then you already made a decision to be there. That's your fault. Okay? I get tired of people calling me up. I have this occasion periodically. And somebody calls me up and tries to make an excuse for something that they made a choice to do anyway. So I finally ask him, I said, well, what did you do? What did you do as a man to put yourself in that position? Uh. <laughs> I said, you married her. You married her. That's your fault. Nobody else said I do. You did. But, 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 but. Don't make excuses. And don't let your young men make excuses for their behavior. The first thing you want to do in training the training process is to teach them not to make excuses. Having said that, Know the difference between an excuse and a reason. If someone were to come to you and tell you that so-and-so did this, and so-and-so comes up and you ask them and you say, did you do this? And they say, yes, but. Save yourself a lot of pain and frustration and listen to them. First, you may find that the circumstances warranted them making that decision and doing something to keep something bad from happening. So you always listen first. And I tell you, that was one of the most difficult things I learned. I'm 51 now. My kids are basically grown. And I did not do that well. I don't by nature listen now. Listen to your kids first. I know God designed us to make decisions, but we need to listen to them because we might have some information that we haven't yet got. He said, well, I, I picked up the bike. Did you pick up the bike in the yard? Yes, I picked up the bike. Uh, what did you do with the bike? That's kind of stuff. You know, sometimes kids don't give you all the information at once. Well, I picked it up and I put it over against this because it didn't have a kickstand. By the way, I got bike issues out here right now. But anyway, I moved them all before I came in. But the point is, there's a difference between an excuse and a reason. I said, yeah, I picked up the bike. Okay. Did you put the kickstand down on the bike? Yes, I did. Well, then why is the bike laying over? Well, they put the kickstand down, turn around and walk away. The, thing, the weight of the bike slowly pushed it down into the chips and it fell over. Okay, there's kind of an extenuating circumstance there, which doesn't excuse the fact that the bot fell over, but that's not what I would call a punishable offense, right? So you get the child and you say, okay, go back out, <laughs> fix the bike, put the kickstand down where it won't fall over, and make sure the bike doesn't move before you leave, right? Now, if they make an excuse, and if they lie, you sit on them because they need to understand that in such a fashion that when they're the father, they will teach their kids not to make excuses, right? Very important. God does not want us making excuses, does he? If you're a strong person, it's not too hard to help others, to tell others what to do. But to honor your head, to honor Christ as your head, you need to learn to tell yourself no. When David was up on that rooftop, when David saw Bathsheba, all he had to do was get off the roof. Okay? David didn't have the internet. David didn't have TV. David didn't even have magazines yet. All he had to do was go downstairs. What have been a 
not easy. After the, what he chose, the choices that he made, ended up killing her husband and all that kind of stuff. He didn't have the internet at his fingertips, and he still didn't tell himself no. I think the reason why so many young women dress immodestly is because their dads are living a life of shame and cannot demand better for their daughters because you can't teach somebody how to say no unless you're doing it yourself. Amen. When you understand you and your wife Chapter 7, please. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof he wrote unto me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. What kind of punctuation is at the end of that? A superior. No ifs, ands, or buts. Just a plain statement. Easy to figure out, right? Skip down to verse 4. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. Likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. When you marry, you're one. You own each other. Okay? It's a beautiful thing. You understand you and your wife are one. She has power over your body as you do hers. It should make you realize she should be mad at you for not waiting for her. She has every right to be mad if you don't wait for her. You're one. Abstinence before marriage is important. So is abstinence in marriage. Okay? If you're living in the tyranny of your shameful emotions due to sin in your life, stop! Put it off. Colossians 3. Just put it off. Lay it at the foot of the cross. Have your wife put passwords on everything. That's what I had to do. Okay? Whatever it takes. My dad used to say, whatever it takes to get the job done, right? Get rid of it. If you have to, get rid of it. The phone, the internet, whatever you have to get rid of. Do whatever you have to do to live a life free of shame. So you can love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Ephesians 5. Then, without the shame, we can live a life. We can teach. How are young men abstinence? They can learn to tell their fleshly desires no. So when they go to the altar, when they go down the altar to be married to the individual who is to be their helpmate for the rest of their temporary lives down here, okay? They can go there with a clear conscience and start a godly marriage off right. That's one of the biggest reasons why we started this camp. Because some of the things that our group believes are hard to find. And I'm not bragging. They're hard to find. Do we always do them right? No. Have I not, have I, have I had issues with pornography in my life? Yes, I have. Was it a shame to me? Was it difficult for my wife? Absolutely. But 
but when a man finds himself in that place, he needs to get on his knees before his head, before Christ. Then he might need to get on his knees before his wife. One of the hardest things I ever had to do was to tell my kids that I had a problem with God. My kids respect me. They love me. They put no t-shirts for me. You know, best dad, hands down. I wore it this week. But my kids are going to have to look to God for their future, not me. There's going to come a day where they're going to look past me and they're going to hopefully look back and say, you know what, at least dad was honest. Dad had issues, but you know what? He was honest. You can't separate the truth from love. They go together. They're intrinsically linked. But being a godly man is about leadership. Yes, it is. It is about being strong when others are weak. But it's also about honoring your head. About submitting to Christ about the humility to serve God and others. It's about being led of the Spirit instead of succumbing to your flesh. In short, being a man is learning to first tell yourself no. That song somewhere here Life's not easy. 
easy. It's not going to be easy. But he has made us able to bear it. To be response able to bear it. So what is it? Was it to be a man? Do you need to be tough? Yes, you do. But you need to know where the truth lies. You need to know who your head is, Christ. And you need to take the information from God's Word seriously. So when you fall into that Joshua 24 mode, and you own it, and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's close. You know what, Jesus? Thank you for all you've given us. Thank you for giving us your son to die on the cross for our sins. Being an example of what we need to be. And Jesus saying, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. Help us to look to our head. Help us to go to Philippians 2. Help us to learn the mind of Christ. Help us to be growing up in your love, not ours. And help us to, as men, own our stuff. And help us to learn to do that by your power. Somebody uh, run out.